I can at least say there was some good news about Raw. And that is you had something that was worthwhile watching. Now, the bad thing is that didn't happen until we got two and a half hours into the damn show. Like the last half hour had plenty of good. The first two and a half hours pretty much sucked. So that's still not good. And to have such kind of like an action-packed finish to the show felt refreshing and felt cool. But as I sat there and watched it, it would have really been nice to have those things not be back-to-back -back at the end of the show. There's something to flow of a show and there is something to pacing. And that is basically lulling everybody to sleep for two and a half hours and then shooting them with fucking adrenaline is not the way to do it. So, while there was good, there was still two and a half hours of mostly crap. And even the things that were good are really good. There are still things that I question about them. And look, that's the way it's going to be sometimes. I do wonder sometimes, for those that sit there and I say something was good, but I point out something that didn't work or something that could potentially be better, and people really get caught up in their feelings and emotions about that, I really wonder how you deal with constructive criticism and feedback in your day-to-day -day lives, especially in your business professional lives. Like, that's basic business 101. Like, that's the way the world works. You could do something great and somebody's still going to find a way to poke a hole in something. And you have to learn how to deal with that, learn how to be comfortable with that. And sometimes I wonder, like, at the end of the day, is this professional wrestling? And if it could be better, let's call it out and talk about it being better. And there's most certainly plenty that could be better on this show, even the things that were really good. But it took a while to get to the good. And it's like starting off this 24-7 mixed tag match. You know, so many things that work about the 24-7 title, similar to the hardcore title all those years back. The different feel of it. The spontaneity of it. The fact that... That is a title that could be defended anytime, anywhere, any place, and it opens up all types of creative possibilities. To me, the last thing you would want to do is have a fucking title match in the damn ring. It's like the WWE just can't help themselves. Hashtag WWE ruins everything is a real thing. Because, by God, it's like they look at something, a germ of an idea... It gets over, it works, and they're like, oh, we weren't prepared for that. And in this case, since this was reportedly USA Network's idea to have this 24-7 title more than it was Vince's, it's like eventually Vince can't wait to sink his greasy, grimy, grubby grips into it and figure out a way to undercut and ruin the whole damn concept. And to me, this was the week that it jumped the shark. First, by having the damn match in the ring where... It just blends in like everything else instead of feeling unique. Then you're introducing Mike Kanellis into it when really, to be realistic, this whole thing has been carried by Drake Maverick and our truth There is no reason at this particular moment, at least until through SummerSlam, to do anything different with it. But now you go from that to having Mike Kanellis winning it to then go backstage, hide, his wife is knocking on the door, says if she, he doesn't open the door, she's going to kick him in the vagina. Ha ha ha, what edgy content we have now. Ha, 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 ha. Just so that way she can boss him around, tell him to get on the floor, and she pins him, and now she's a pregnant 24-7 champion. I don't know why this company is so obsessed with Maria every time they have her, like she's some type of real deal talent or somebody that's going to really move the needle for him. Ding dong, dumb dick, she's not. And it was at this moment I was like, Yep, this will probably never be the same again. One of the few things and reasons we had to actually tune into Raw that might actually give us a chance to feel like we were entertained or got something out of the time we invested in the product on a weekly basis now sucks. So thanks a lot for that. But even beyond that, you look at what you've got here. Oh, so often the case of WWE, things feel like a ginormous waste of time. This gauntlet match to determine a number one contender for the United States Championship to face AJ Styles at SummerSlam. You know, the whole thing about getting rid of the automatic rematches shouldn't be just to have long, drawn-out matches 
to have the former champion just get his rematch back anyways. That eliminates the whole point of this. There's still no spontaneity. There's still no anything. It's just stupid and is probably a product of necessity for trying to fill three hours of damn show every single week, which is still in and of itself absolutely ridiculous. But you have this gauntlet match only to have Ricochet win just so that way he could face off with AJ Styles again. And even if that's the case, so effing be it. But what really didn't make sense to me is if you want Ricochet to get over, which clearly somebody in this company really likes him, then why wouldn't you have him come out first? Why wouldn't you have him go through everybody? You had him come out last. That just seems counterintuitive to what you're trying to accomplish here. I don't know. I, I, just, I just didn't get it. You know? Or even when they got to the point of they had Rey Mysterio start, but then he eliminates a couple of guys to get eliminated himself. If you're not going to have Ricochet go the entire way, at least have Rey Mysterio go the entire way. And even beyond all of that, you look at it, here is an opportunity for a title shot, a shot at the U.S. title, and you got guys in this match, when was the last time they won any fucking thing? Why the hell are they being rewarded? Again, the concept of wins and losses don't mean anything cause damage here because there is no hierarchy to anything. And there is no purpose for anything because you just randomly throw any fucking thing against the wall and hope to God it sticks. It's whatever. Um, you know, the way you punish somebody like Jimmy Uso for repeated stupidity is to not give him and his brother a tag team title shot on Raw. And saying, well, Jimmy Uso ultimately ate the pin, so he got his punishment. Appearing on primetime cable television in front of millions of viewers, in front of the fans in the audience, and getting to go for several minutes in a tag team title match in no way, shape, or form is fucking punishment. He still got his television exposure, he still got his exposure in front of the fans, and he still gets his payday. <clears throat> That's crap. This is not just a matter of he got drunk in his front yard and he passed out or something like that. The difference between him and Jeff Hardy, where they both have history, of stupidity just just runs deeper and is much more wide in terms of its overall scope is Jimmy Uso is doing this and getting into fights with cops and he's sitting there and getting himself into trouble and putting other people potentially at risk that, that's a key difference here you know should you fire Jimmy Uso there's an argument to be made worst case scenario he should not be allowed to appear on television that's ridiculous and the Viking Raiders are still stupid and look, I know everybody's just going to automatically want to blame Vince because at the end of the day, he's the HNIC of all that you see when it comes to WWE, and I get that. But even in that case, the, the people right below him and the creative infrastructure can prevent, pre present him excuse me, better things to work with that even when he tries to screw it up, don't screw it up as bad. And what I'm wondering is, is if Raw continues to stink, for three months, six months down the road, how much longer is Paul Heyman going to get a free pass to where we just blame everything on Vince automatically? Like even all the crap with Road Dog and we were talking about Fire Road Dog and everything like that. There was actually fans wanting to hold Road Dog accountable for the shit we were seeing on SmackDown. It wasn't just blame Vince, blame Vince, blame Vince, but because it's fucking Paul Heyman, we're going to blame Vince every which way we possibly can, and that is crap. If anything, we should blame Paul Heyman no more because we know he freaking knows better. Like, what the hell are you accomplishing here with the Viking Raiders? Like, what, what's the point of them? You know, like so many other things, the gauntlet match. You could say, well, Paul Lee got rid of the freaking, all the elimination tag matches and the run-ins to not have wrestling during commercial breaks. That is a good, positive change. But as much as anything else, that is one of those Vince McMahon whims that you sit there and you ride through and two or three months later he changes his fucking mind again anyway. So even in that case, I don't necessarily credit Paul Heyman for that. That's just Vince's damn history. But seriously, when you look at this show, you just can't only blame Vince here. At the end of the day, yes, the buck stops with him, but he's not the only one putting this crap together. Like you look at the match with Becky Lynch and Alexa Bliss. Not only was that segment, that moment of bliss with Alexa and Nikki cringeworthy earlier in the night, then you had this match that was equally cringeworthy. Alexa's faking a goddamn ankle injury to the point where she's crying hysterically like 
She's supposed to be a heel. She's supposed to be a bitch. You're supposed to hate her. And having her cry to that level to sell fake bullshit just seems stupid. So that way that match could be called. So that way Becky could beat Nikki Cross to where eventually Alexa attacks. But then here comes an Italian to attack. Like, what the fuck is going on here? Like, what did you hope that this was going to accomplish? I, I, I just can't. Like, I can't imagine emphasizing as you're trying to focus on a character like Alexa Bliss, showing everybody and emphasizing to everybody how much she's whining and crying like a little baby because her leg was hurt. Give me a fucking break. That was stupid. Oh, and by the way, speaking of stupid, <laughs> fuck Dolph Ziggler! I don't need any fucking thing other than that. The fact that he's being featured prominently in any way on television, Raw and SmackDown every week, will just make the inevitable Goldberg squash at SummerSlam that much more worth it and rewarding. Because why? You guessed it. <laughs> Fuck Dolph Ziggler. But after that, here comes Brock Lesnar, who beat the ever-loving shit out of Seth Rollins. In the ring, around the ring, and then once Seth Rollins gets wheeled out to an ambulance and loaded into an ambulance, there's Brock Lesnar to stop it and F5 him on the fucking thing. That's crazy. That was crazy. And you know what? You look at it from an optic standpoint, you're like, well, thank God, something actually happened on the show that's worth a shit. Something actually on the show had some impact. And that's true. I do look at this, though, and I say, as far as Brock goes, to me, if anything, you could say, well, he wants to get some revenge for losing at WrestleMania. Okay, understood. But he's kind of already got the revenge because he's the champ now. And if anything, when you're talking about Seth Rollins, he had to go to these lengths to try to incapacitate Seth Rollins. Does not elevate Seth Rollins. If anything, it de-elevates Brock Lesnar. Because why the hell would he sit there? As bad as it is hearing Seth Rollins talking about that Brock Lesnar's a wannabe Seth Rollins and they go so far out of their way to try and make a guy look cool. Like, what the bluest of blue fucks are you doing? If you have to try that hard, uh, maybe the problem is the dude just isn't cool and you should stop doing that shit. But, but the whole thing, this whole time, it's like, I'd rather they started the show with this, frankly. It would have helped. Um... It just didn't work for me that much. Like, Brock shouldn't have to sit there and beat up Seth Rollins to this level. Like, I could see if he was doing that to Roman Reigns or Braun Strowman, but he's doing it to Seth Rollins. Why? He should beat the brakes off of that Joker any fucking ways. You're Brock Lesnar. It would have made much more sense if a Seth Rollins attacked Brock Lesnar like this and did this type of stuff, because then you're trying to elevate him, and then you could still say... After all this beatdown, Brock Lesnar still got up and refused medical attention. So he's a badass, too. Like, there's the way that could work to could get one or both guys more over. Or you typically choose the WWE way where they do it and nobody really benefits or gets over from it. That said, it at least made for interesting television. But at this point in time, by God, two and a half plus hours into a damn show, you could use it. I think the real highlight of the night, though, was the Samoan Summit that never really happened with Joe and the Reigns. This shit was intense. This shit was really good. This was a real fight. Oh, and backtracked you for just a second here. One of the other things that really baffled me was, maybe it's partially structurally, because right after this you were having Roman Reigns and Samoa Joe do their thing. But if you space this out early in the night, when Seth Rollins is getting beat down, where the fuck is his girlfriend, Becky Lynch? Where the fuck is his, his dog, his best friend, Roman Reigns? How come they're not running out there to try and save him? How come they're not trying to run out there to protect him? How come they're not trying to run out there to help him? Once Seth Rollins eventually gets loaded up into the fucking ambulance, how come nobody's there to see him off? Like, these things that should help advance a story, they did none of this. It's just really weird. But anyways... This whole Samoa Summit thing, that really wasn't. You thought that maybe this could be really stupid. It just ended up being this big brawl and fight for the last several minutes of the damn show. And you know what? That was pretty fucking cool. Sure, they were only doing it to make sure that Roman got featured prominently as they were showing some Hobbs and Shaw-related stuff throughout the show and then after the show. But it worked. Now, as far as making Cedric Alexander a focal point of it, I don't know if that necessarily works. 
But I guess. Cool. Maybe. But 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 here again, like there was at least something to grab onto. There was at least something to make you say, you know what, this wasn't totally a shit show the entire time. It left you with something to look forward to. It left you with a good impression with the last thing that you saw in the night. And that is something. As for so many shows, so many weeks, when you talk about Raw, you just have nothing. At least here, you had something. Now, sure, quickly, they will go back with Seth Rollins, you would think, and bring them back on Raw like nothing ever the fuck happened. Because they're idiots. Like, they should even be calling the match at SummerSlam into damn question to sell this thing. But, of course, WWE ruins everything, so I would be stunned if Seth Rollins wasn't on Raw next week and either minimally or completely no-selling the damn injuries he should have suffered at the hands of Brock Lesnar. So, yeah. Two and a half hours of crap. 30 minutes that give you a little bit of hope that at least for one week... There was something worthwhile. You just hope it wouldn't come at 10.30 p.m. Eastern and later when you're already a long since cashed out on the damn show for the night. And for those that are sitting there talking about it was a great Raw and this and that, my God, how far the standards dropped. Most of the other shit was garbage. And it's okay to admit it was garbage. It's not like you wrote it. It's not like you booked it. It's not like you produced this shit. It's okay to say, I watched... And it was mostly trash until the end. And even the stuff at the end could have been done differently or better, at least in my estimation. But I guess that's why I'm an angry wrestling man. But more importantly, that's why OTRS Central is not the wrestling show you want, just the wrestling show you need, because I'll keep it real whether you like it or not.